Um, I want to say, uh, and I, I would like for uh, Drs. Kirkwood and Weber, and we'll ask Dr. DeVille, do you want to join up here as well? Or, yeah. Yep, no, no? Okay. I'll tell you what, he's, uh, Dr. Vilo is, is not a physician. He's a, he's a basic science kind of guy. So if we have any basic science questions, if you want to ask about mice or cell lines, he's available. So if I could get the two of you to come up uh, onto this table, and I just want to say one thing while they're coming. We, we hear so much about the progress of the last six years since your boy was approved, um, and, and it has been astounding, as Dr. Kirkwood said, 10, 10 new therapies and just this much time, really. It's, it's just unprecedented in any cancer field to see that much progress that quickly. But, but these two people and others like them spent the majority of their careers working in a field where it was like beating your head against the <coughs> wall. And the big cancer meetings where 30,000 cancer doctors come from all around the world to share results and, 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 and uh, hear what the latest studies are. Every year, the melanoma people would come together and say, we tried this and it didn't work. We tried this and it didn't work. We tried this and we didn't work. And for much of their careers, they would see people come through their doors with stories like you heard today and know that the vast majority of those patients would be dead within a year. And that's hard. That's hard. Because you know what? Doctors are people too. And it's hard. And they persisted. And they stayed with it. And they kept pushing. And the, the results that we've seen in these last three, four, five years is because of people just like this. So uh, I just want to say thank you for your persistence and for sticking with this field. When many, many other people sought other fields where they could make more progress, um, and, and the, p the stories we've heard here today really are the results of that dedication. So now you get to have all of your questions answered. <laughs> uh, so, so I have a question in the back right here, yes. Check. There you go. Thank you for your presentation uh, today and for those who gave their stories today. It's very moving, very um, inspiring, quite frankly. So thank you. First question. With the Ipi and Nevo patients that you've treated or experienced, uh, what do the long-term patients look like when it comes to severe adverse events, specifically with pituitary function? Does it return? What percentage of patients are returning to normal function, if at all? And what do you see the, um, the future looking like there? In patients who have pituitary abnormalities, relatively few will ever recover their own function spontaneously. The thyroid function, I've seen maybe a third of the patients will recover some or all thyroid function. Once you blow the pituitary, you blow the pituitary. It's gone. And I would say 70, 80, at least 80 percent of the patients will not recover significant function, and you'll be on replacement hormones for the rest of your life. On the other hand, Interestingly, there's probably some association between getting the pituitary abnormalities and doing well. It's not 100%. The association is there. It's not incredibly strong, but it's in my view, it's definitely real. Just like that slide I showed about the skin side effects, probably you see something like that for the endocrine side effects. But once the pituitary function is gone, it's 80% of the time it's going to be gone permanently, unfortunately. Thank you. Follow up for Dr. Kirkwood. Who just one second. Did you want to add something? I just want to say that our experience with the pituitary annihilation is similar. It has not reversed in any patients that I've uh, followed. But the thyroid uh, dysfunction that we've got a lot longer, 30-year, uh, 35-year, I guess, uh, experience, that often comes back. And oddly, the flip side is also true, that some people who don't have thyroid overactivity, underactivity, on these immunotherapies may get that or vitiligo or other findings uh, years down the road. And so it, um, in a sense, it's make, made us all better doctors because, as Jeff was pointing out, I avoided endocrinology like the plague when I was uh, <laughs> in medical school at Yale. But, but we need really the diabetic, uh, hypo hypophysitis, uh, thyroid, and so forth. We're the people who need to be alert to that and it's part of the management of these new immunotherapies, all of them. Dr. Kirkwood, who do we contact for that Dream Doublets trial uh, it's, and information? It's an intergroup study, so any hospital, any practice that's a part of uh, 
what we call the clinical trials support unit, uh, CTSU, uh, can gain access to that. So it should be a hospital within um, stone's throw, I mean, not really, but almost, of every single person in the room because from Baja, California to Bangor, Maine, you know, there are centers participating in these um, intergroup trials. This is an intergroup trial. It's not just ecog Akron or just SWOG. It's all of the trial groups. Uh, yeah, and, and if you have trouble finding it, our, our website is melanoma.org. <coughs> Just send an email to us or give us a call, and, and uh, we, we'll look it up. Tell us where you are. We'll look it up and try to find the center that's closest to you. The other thing is clinicaltrials.gov. You should be able to name the trial, and then it'll tell you where. You, it'll, you just put in what state you live in, and it'll tell you where the nearest place is. Yeah. So clinicaltrials.gov is a website that lists all clinical trials. It is really horrible. It's, it's really hard to manage, but if you know the name of the trial or the number of the trial, you can find it. It'll list all the sites there, and that's something that yep. we can also help you with. And, and so if we you may want have to do a little digging, but we'll get it to you. If, if you want the numbers, EA6134 is the Dream Doublet versus Dream Doublet trial. The triplet trial, which is the GM plus Ipinevo, is EA6141. I'm sorry for those gibberish designations. They're just what we're stuck and with. And the first one was EA6134. So if you go into clinicaltrials.gov and in the search field, just put EA. Yeah, if you put that in, it'll direct you 60, by your state. 6134, and at the bottom of the list, it'll tell you all the participating sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those of us that have the severe hypophysitis, um, where do we go for an endocrinologist that can absolutely understand what we're going through? Because it's a living hell. And when you go to the oncologist, and he doesn't really understand it. And when you go to your so-called layman endocrinologist, um, everybody's afraid of it and nobody knows what to do with it and suffering from the depression and the ups and the downs. Nobody wants to throw really uh, antidepressant because they don't want to throw you into all this other stuff. I and would so say it would have to be, I, I would not, this is beyond the routine experience of a community endocrinologist. It would have to be someone at a referral center that sees a lot of the patients. So just going north to south, it would be Dana-Farber, Yale, Memorial, NYU, um, Moffitt, of course. We had a lot of patients there. MD Anderson, UCLA, UCSF, Angeles Clinic in Los Angeles, uh, Providence in Portland, University of Washington. Um, I would I would hope that Colorado has an endocrinologist who's seen a bunch of these patients, because if they don't, it's going to have to be somewhere else. And U of Chicago would be another place, but it's mostly unfortunately mostly clustered at the on the coasts. The big university medical centers anywhere should have endocrinologists who uh, can help with this, and um, if they don't, people in the um, cooperative group um, system are now becoming pretty savvy with this. And the algorithms for managing these things are now being articulated in protocols that you know, over time, I think, will get to the community. You know, it's an interesting question that I'll put to, to the company, to BMS, um, and it's something, Shelby, for us to think about. Maybe we should, maybe we should see if we can find a list of endocrinologists who <coughs> are, um, have experience working with people who have these kinds of immunotherapy related issues that that might be an important resource for patients and yeah. rheumatologists and mm. gastroenterologists i mean this is not confined to any yeah, yeah. single subdiscipline yeah. the the gi savvy with uh autoimmune colitis isn't every gi person out there and I have to tell you, we've been looking for endocrinologists, but we've also been looking for rheumatologists to help mm. our patients with the various arthritic complications, yeah. uh, which are sometimes equally a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more interested in the research side. How is that all coordinated where all these trials don't get duplicated? Because I work with Moffitt and some other cancer specialists, and they said they all got their trials going on, but I don't know, you know, how do you guys talk to each other so a lot of time's not wasted when they do a trial? Do they just set up their own trials? Yeah, so the national cooperative groups um, are very well integrated. Um, we have in ECOG-Akron a melanoma committee which has 
30 members that talk every single month for more than an hour every Friday. SWOG has a similar melanoma committee call. And because you're absolutely right, we don't want SWOG duplicating what ECOG Akron are doing or vice versa, the members of the SWOG Melanoma Committee come to the ECOG Akron committee mem uh, meetings and vice versa. Can so you define what ECOG and SWOG are? So Tell ECOG is Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. SWOG is Southwest Oncology Group. These are the only two national cooperative groups that have melanoma committees. That's the reason we've focused on it. makes it a little bit simpler. But even then, it's not uh, always uh, self-apparent that there won't be duplication. And I think duplicating our efforts is the one thing we don't want to see, and we've been trying to avoid by these um, liaison functions between each of the committees. And these are the large trials. Tend, they tend to be the phase three trials. The early <coughs> phase trials, to be honest, within the U.S. are somewhat duplicated, and there's sometimes a good reason for that and sometimes a bad reason. A good reason would be if you live in Florida uh, and someone has a terrific early phase trial idea and there's only enough patients to do it in three centers if it's done in New York, Boston, and Los Angeles, you're going to have to travel a long way. But if there is some duplication around the country, you won't have to travel a thousand miles to get on a promising trial in an early phase setting, meaning someone has failed other therapies. Whereas the trials John's talking about tend to be the frontline therapies for the newly diagnosed patients, the large trials where you're comparing drug regimen X versus the standard treatment to try to prove which is better. In the old days, most of those trials were done by the cooperative groups. Today, they're done some by the cooperative groups. A lot of them are done by the companies themselves. Those tend to not get that duplicated. The early phase stuff, to be honest, is duplicated. And there is, uh, to be honest, there's a little bit of a free enterprise system within early phase research where individual investigators will write grants and make proposals to do early phase studies, but they're small studies. Many of them can be done at one center or two centers. And if they're both in Florida and you're living in California, you're out of luck. So in a way, it's good that the wealth is spread around, that the promising studies are done in different locations. But the big ones tend to be done, if it's a pharmaceutical trial, they'll pick 20 of the 20 centers and they'll scatter them around the U.S. geographically. And ECOG, SWOG, tends to be the, someone is a couple hours away by car, almost anywhere in the United States. So the early phase studies, I'm sorry, the fa like a phase one study, 20 patients, 20 to 40, something like that usually? Usually less than 50. Yeah. Less than 50 patients. Yeah. So that's why you're saying they're small studies, and you can, if you have them in different places, even if they are duplicative, that's not a bad thing for patients. And then you get into phase two, and phase two can be ranged a pretty big, big range of the number of patients, but most of them are relatively small still. Then the phase three, you get into hundreds of patients often, if not over a thousand. Yep. But there are actually um, large contracts to what are called phase one clinical trials groups and phase two clinical trials groups. Uh, University of Pittsburgh has both of these, and basically that system is coordinated also through the NCI to try to make sure that early phase trials get the adequate you know, the support adequate to do uh, what they need to do. The NCI is the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the NIH. And phase one trials, we didn't say, but I guess it may be known as just to seek toxicity, to understand the mechanism of the agent. Phase two is to find out the first evidence of benefit that would then catapult it into a many hundreds of patient trials to finally make the answer definitive. Although it's worth adding one clarification to what John just said. While the primary reason why you do a phase one study is to find out about the tolerability of the side effects and to choose a dose to take further, there is still a therapeutic intent to those studies, meaning you don't do a study deliberately not looking for the potential for benefit. It might not be the primary endpoint, but it is an endpoint, every sure. goal. Every study has one primary goal by definition, but it also has secondary goals, and those secondary goals can often be as important as the primary one. And in almost every early phase study, the so-called phase one studies, the first in human trials, therapeutic intent is always there. We shouldn't just echo this back and forth, but I think we didn't mention that you've heard in lovely historic detail about IPI and the first uh, TREMI trials that were the CTLA-4 blockade first generation checkpoint inhibitors. Then the sequel studies, which were the second generation PD-1 trials. But in the current arena, we have several 
new agents that fit the third generation of checkpoint inhibitors, TIM3, TIGIT, a bunch of things that you'll hear about that we didn't get to talk about today, they have to enter phase one trials to find out how much, but we know already in the mouse or in the test tube that these add to the benefits of CTLA-4 and PD-1. So that's an example of what Jeff is mentioning, that the third generation checkpoints, uh, you would want to jump to be in that trial if you'd had CTLA-4, if you'd had PD-1, and you need new therapy. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, the worldwide network for melanoma research, which is now not a rut, but a groove, um, I think is really uh, developing very well. The international working group I mentioned to you has uh, membership from 20 sites across the globe, and we're really trying to get new trials to all of the world. And when trials are done through the companies, they will often do them internationally, although you have to be a little cautious certain trials can only be done in certain parts of the world because let's say there's a drug approved in the U.S. that's not approved in the EU, then what your reference arm would be in the EU is different than what it would be in the U.S. So the authorities that approve drugs don't always approve the drugs the same way in one country as another. But uh, John and I know most of the usual suspects in the melanoma world. We all know, you know, you have a couple of people in France, you have a couple of people in Germany, there's a guy in the UK who we all know is a good guy. I mean, I can name you names if you want. Uh, there are a couple of folks in Italy. Uh, the Netherlands has uh, some very good people. So Western Europe has people who see a lot of patients and Southern Europe. Um, probably fewer people as you go into Eastern Europe. China has a different spectrum of melanoma. Uh, it's mostly mucosal melanoma and it's a highly centralized health system. So it's really one guy who sees many of the patients. Japan is just not a common tumor. Uh, Australia has, again, because many of the people from Australia are of Anglo-Saxon extraction living in a sunny clime, that per capita they see a lot of melanoma, so they have actually three or four very good melanoma docs that we all know. So there's a, you know, we all communicate, we're all colleagues, and often we're on phone calls together and through John's working group. Uh, I would say that the active investigators in Europe, Australia, and Canada all know each other, and the U.S. Zing us up an email if you want any pointers. I mean, Judith Olaf is in. There are some things that are being done earlier in Europe than in the U.S. I mean, that's the flip side is that the, um, the way that trials are done are a little different. And um, so it's no longer sequestered alone in the U.S. Uh, let's, in let's move on to the next question, please. Thank you. Um, so my mom was diagnosed with primary cervical mucosal melanoma, and I'm not sure if um, I'll be able to get an answer or not, but she's not typically, her genes aren't amplified BR, um, with the BRAF, MEC, GNAQ, GNA11, but I'm just curious to see if there's any research or clinical trials for genes YAP1, BIRC3, CF, CSF, 1R, PD, G, F, R, B, and C, B, L. Um, the reason why I ask this, it seems that based on the gene amplification, there's treatment that cor correlates to it. Um, and with my mom, with mucosal melanoma, they used uh, treatments for cutaneous melanoma, which I know that the, the gene activity is a component. Well, patients who have mucosal melanoma can still respond very well to immunotherapy. To be honest, the response rate's probably not quite as high, but it's clearly significant. And we've all had patients with mucosal melanoma that have done very well or have had complete responses to combination immunotherapy. And in fact, one of the best TIL responders I ever saw was a mucosal patient. So tumor infiltrating lymphocytes would be a very attractive option for such patients, and would as would it be plus Nevo. I don't think, again, you just reeled them off. I don't, I'd have to look at them in detail, but of the what we call the basket trials, where patients are sorted for treatment by their gene mutations, not by their type of tumor, but just by their genetic makeup. I don't think 
any of the ones you mentioned have dr are druggable targets, meaning that there's a drug that specifically targets that genetic change from what you just said. Although PDGF receptor, I suppose you could look at uh, nilotinib or yeah. imatinib. Yeah, I think there are uh, also new agents coming for CSF1R uh, that are going to be available, but uh, again, these are uh, mutation uh, targeted trials, uh, so-called basket trials that um, would be the best likely source of an option for that, uh, for those kinds of abnormalities. But on clinicaltrials.gov, if you go look for the NCI match, M-A-T-C-H trial, it'll tell you on the website what mutations the patients might be eligible for or de what mutations they would be required to have to be eligible for that trial where the treatment is tailored to the genetic makeup, not. So you could have breast cancer and colon cancer. It's not just one or the other. It's any cancer that has mutation X or Y or Z. But it's not overexpression. It's mutation, an actual genetic change. And, or, you know, and to be honest, her oncologist, whoever that person is, what institution is she being treated at? So yeah, I mean, the guys at Sloan Kettering know this stuff. I mean, the, the guys in the melanoma group are all experienced investigators, so they can look it up for me. Over here. Yes. Um, I have a question. You mentioned, uh, I, I'm a McCussell um, melanoma patient, uh, diagnosed in 2015, going into my second year. And I read that um, China had a study that involved Gleevec for that particular type, and I'm wondering if you've heard anything about that, or I is there any clinical trials here in America that is studying adding Gleevec into the ipinevo combo, or? Hmm. So there is one trial that is just launched out of Ohio State University that uh, adds uh, imatinib Gleevec to um, anti-PD-1 pembrolizumab, and so that uh, is a trial. We just completed one in ECOG uh, and presented it at the national meetings testing desatinib, which is another member of this family that may antagonize uh, a bunch of different pathways, but including uh, the CKIT exon 11 and 13 mutations that are more common in mucosal melanomas. Sadly, it didn't show any improved benefit over imatinib Gleevec, and so we don't think that was a basis for future progress. Mm -hmm. um, John, was that just for people with a CKIT mutation? It was. So oh, it well, half of the trial we did for the site specific, and then we realized it was so low a frequency that we had to focus upon only the uh, CKIT mutation patients, and so we restricted it to those with just those mutations. If, of if you have the, if the tumor has the mutations, there's a potential <coughs> to respond to those drugs. The problem is even when you respond to the drugs, the responses are short-lived. So in the published literature on Gleevec, and the successor drug, nilotinib, as single agents in mucosal melanoma, it's really not very promising. I mean, I've seen maybe one patient who's been a long-term survivor who had those mutations who just got Gleevec. I would be thinking of other drugs to benefit patients with mucosal melanoma, not those drugs. We had a very active volunteer. He was on Gleevec for many years um, as, as a monotherapy. Yeah. So it does, but it, but so just for, for uh, you've heard the BRAF mutation. A lot of people have heard that. In cutaneous melanoma, maybe half of people have a mutation in, in, in that area, BRAF. Um, the next most common mutation is NRAS, right? About 20% of all melanomas have an NRAS mutation. And the next one beyond that is a mutation called CKIT. CKIT is more common in mucosal melanoma. Um, and so you know all of these are targetable areas. And in ocular melanoma, the mutations are in uh, points called GNAQ, GNA11, and we don't have good drugs to target GNAQ or GNA11 right now. Uh, they, they tend to be really difficult. And if I'm, I'm not a doctor, so if I'm, getting, if I'm saying something stupid, don't no, hesitate to tell me. No, you're right I'm on. Stupid, so. <laughs> you know, there are many other mutations that are actually fairly common in melanoma. The problem is not every mutation is druggable, meaning you can't always find, for example, RAS, R-A-S, is one of the most commonly mutated genes in cancer in general. And for 30 years, people have been trying to come up with a drug to target mutated RAS, and it really hasn't worked. Yeah. It's not like it's for lack of trying or the fact that people are dumb. There are a lot of smart people 
in industry and academia. A lot of money has been wasted on RAS drugs. It's just, you know, tumors are clever. Uh, they evolve within the lifespan of the patient to avoid and evade getting inhibited. And it's very difficult to target some mutations because they're so ubiquitous, the, the thing you're targeting is so ubiquitously present that you would have horrendous toxicity if you tried to target them. We're very lucky in that certain things like BRAF can be targeted without severe side effects. We're very lucky in that this complicated immune system, which at 10 different steps, the tumor can evade and avoid, it's amazing that it works, and it works. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for, let me, let me get one more question. I'm gonna ask, I know others have questions. I'll let you do that offline. I wanna make sure we don't get too far off schedule for our lunch. We were supposed to be at lunch five minutes ago? Oh. Six minutes ago, so that's no problem. We'll do this one last question, then we'll just keep it informal after that if we could. Okay, the first part, of, I have oh, more wait, of I'll a I'll comment. Okay, you go, and then I'll let you no, go. Okay. Right. Two questions. So the first part of my question, or I guess is more of a comment, um, I was diagnosed stage one shortly after my first pregnancy and stage four during my second. I get emotional. Um, so Dr. Kirkwood, you said that um, you would like to give more information. My request, and maybe for Tim too, is OB doctors. I was told that skin changes are normal during pregnancy. so. Please include them. And then I guess my second question could also go to Dr. Davila, but as well the two of you or my actual question. Um, with the growing number of melanomas during women or for women during their 20s, is there a correlation with pregnancy being a part of that? Is that just a huge question? So we've been concerned about this, and I was guilty I say guilty because I think in retrospect I was guilty of publishing uh, something in the New England Journal back <laughs> 35 years ago when we saw a string of five young women who had the same story that you just uh, gave us. Then we looked in the World Health Organization, which then had a melanoma program where we could actually cull large numbers and look for patients, women who were pregnant, then had a melanoma separate in separate time frame vice versa, or those who had a melanoma that developed during pregnancy. And the interesting finding published by Rona McKay in Lancet about 20 years ago is there was no difference in the outcomes. So I think it's a puzzle. We don't yet have a good answer for it. You're absolutely right. Melasma, which is the flat area of hyperpigmentation that sometimes develop most often in the face, moles, which get larger during pregnancy, have always said to us something seems to be behind this uh, phenomenon that we should understand better. We've done trials of anti-estrogens as therapy, which didn't amount to anything. Uh, I think we really don't know yet uh, any firm um, data to support that often seen uh, scenario. The biggest problem is that a lot of OBEs are reticent to aggressively biopsy and do studies during pregnancy for fear of harming the fetus. But I, John's absolutely right. I don't think there's any evidence that pregnancy itself contributes to the development of the melanoma. Stage for stage, the patients do just as well. The only difference may be the rapidity with which it's diagnosed, and that's the issue, but that just requires, that's a fixable problem. That just requires vigilance. But uh, I don't, I, if someone asked me if I had to bet money and, and make a definitive decision, did the pregnancy affect the melanoma, I'd say no. Right, last question. Um, Dr. Weber, you mentioned kind of a correlation, somewhat anecdotal, between the severity of the immune um, side effects and the durability of the treatment. Is that Actually, true? it's not the severity, it's the whether it happened or not. Whether it happened. Yep. So it, is, it, is it specific to certain, for example, the pituitary, or is it really just that broad spectrum? Because some of us have not had the, fortunately, <laughs> the pituitary issues, but have had the broad spectrum of other um, immune-mediated adverse events that um, you know, led to cessation of treatment. So it's, it's almost any, it's any grade three or four adverse event. In our study, it was any grade two, three, or four adverse event. It didn't matter. 
Skin was the most potent, but it could have been any adverse event. And if you look, so there are other interesting tantalizing <laughs> hints. If you look at the study that John and I showed of the three groups of patients who got Ipi Nevo versus Ipi versus Nevo, if you look at survival of patients in the Ipi Nevo group who had a grade three or four adverse event, an immune related adverse event, versus those who did not, the survival is actually a little bit longer in those who got the event. It's not statistically significant because it wasn't a planned endpoint and the statisticians will go crazy if you try to make it that way. But it's, you know, the curves differ of survival. It's very interesting. So I, I would say there is an association. So to say there's an association doesn't mean every time you get side effects you're going to do well, and it doesn't mean if you get no side effects you're not going to do spectacularly. But there's definitely an association, and understanding that would be very useful. It may give clues as to how this drug works. One, one thing I'd add is that it's a different spectrum of these autoimmune uh, effects with each of the different immunotherapies that we talked about. And there are dramatic differences between Ipi, as Jeff called it, the shotgun, and Nevo or Pembro, the, the rifles. Um, for instance, people who have allografts, kidney transplants, um, heart transplants, even tolerate Ipi. It's disaster with rejection in microseconds almost with the anti-PD ones. Which would almost make no sense. You would think it would be it's the opposite. It almost, by that paradigm, would think the opposite. I'm just saying that for each agent, it's specific, and we need to Why analyze it. <laughs> yep. And I definitely wouldn't give, actually, I just saw a patient yesterday who had a kidney transplant, and the issues were what to do, and she actually decided she would not take on the risk of having to go back on dialysis. She did not want Ipi or Pembro or Nevo declined chemo. She's not an IL-2 candidate. That would be even worse. So we're going to do other things. Okay. And with that, uh, we'll take a break for lunch. But thanks uh, to our, our physicians for giving up a week. Actually, what, what, what would you do?